Hello, I'm Karen Launchbaugh. I'm a professor of rangeland ecology at the University of Idaho, and today we're going to explore the question, what is rangeland management? As you know, rangelands cover about half of the Earth's land surface, so it's really important that we understand the tools and approaches to rangeland management as a global perspective. Okay, a good place to start in this discussion is a definition of rangeland management. The definition I use is the use and stewardship of rangelands to meet the goals and desires of humans. What's interesting to me is that the actual rangeland resources have not changed in, say, the 10,000 or tens of thousands of years that humans have been managing these lands. They're still mostly grasslands and shrublands with a sparse overstory of, of trees, and the plants are mostly naturalized or natural, native plants. What has changed is the goals and desires of hum humans. Historically, and in fact, to the recent past, and then even today, um, one of the desires of humans on rangelands is to produce livestock, livestock products. It's one of the few ways that we can capture the energy from the sun and turn it into something that is useful to us. But that has changed a lot. What humans want from rangelands has changed significantly in the last 50 years or so, at least in the U.S. Um, what rangeland management is, if you step back a little bit, is it's basically a planning process. Now, if you take a class on planning, what you'll find out is that a, a planning process is where you take an understanding of the current situation and you think of ways that you can change it into a desired future condition. So a lot of planning has to do with trying to understand what the future should look like. Other parts of planning are trying to understand how you could assess your current situation and then furthermore, the third middle step is what can we do to go from where we are to where we want to be? So in terms of if you apply that concept of planning to rangeland management, what we do is we look at different alternatives of the future. Um, if we do something, it will have uh, various outcomes in the future and we have to decide which is the best future. What do we want to do today that will change the land to meet the demands of, of humans into the future? Okay, that's kind of tricky. What is the best? Well, it depends on your point of view. Uh, you may have a view that would um, would be within the preservationist camp. You might consider yourself a conservationist or a utilitarianism or maybe just a pragmatist or et cetera, et cetera. You, what your land view is, your land ethic will vary depending on your experience. So just think for just a minute, what is it that you think rangelands should accomplish and how much what is the role that humans should have in using those rangeland resources to meet the demands of society well some of those terms that i've just used let's just clarify those what you're, what is best depends on your point of view preservationists people that fall in that court category would emphasize protection of large areas of land um, and protect them from uses such as mining timber grazing development etc and the idea there was that if we can protect those lands, they'll be enjoyed by the present and future generations. Folks like John Muir and Aldo Leopold, at least in his later life, Aldo Leopold talked a lot, more, a lot more about preservationist approaches. Conservationists are those that view land as a resource that can be used now for economic growth, and it can also be protected from degradation with science-based effective management so that it could be stained for future generations. So the idea that we could use land if we did it carefully and it could be used sustainably uh, for future generations. So sustained yield and multiple use. Uh, people like the Theodore Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, the first, uh, the first chief of the Forest Service, John Wesley Powell, those, they all really thought that land could be used and it could be preserved at the same time. I've got a whole other couple of categories like utilitarianism. Um, is that's the idea that really what we need to do is use land as a substrate to to make money for saleable products. Management then is based on um, the manipulation of uh, reducing the exogenous inputs such as fertilizer herbicides and usually requires us to keep production at an optimal level and, and often optimal economic level. Well, maybe we don't think about people doing this so much today. I think a lot more people really are concerned about the future and sustainability of ecosystems. When we uh, talked in, about the history of range management and talked about people that were out homesteaders and people that were really trying to make a living and try to, to, to prove up a piece of land, I would say they were mostly utilitarianist. They just needed to find a way to prove up the land, make some sellable products, and, and really make a living for their family 
and and the and their community. So again, uh, range management is this idea that you understand where you're at and you try to make decisions that will take you to the future. Where do those decisions come from? When, if you're a range manager, where, where do you get the ideas that m help you make wise decisions to get to the desired future? Well, here's some ideas. One, certainly information is a big part. Like hopefully why information that you get from classes like this or from reading books or going to seminars would help you make wise decisions. There's a whole lot of other ideas in your head when you make a decision that have nothing to do with science-based information. You might have a hunch, you might have a tradition, you might know someone down the road that told you this might work or that might work. So there might be some traditional knowledge, some community knowledge. Sometimes you just have to make a good guess and hope that you're right. Other times you might make decisions because of your needs. You, you might know that this isn't maybe the right way to go, but right now, where you're at today, you have to make that decision because of economics or, eco, eco, um, or community goals. So. Uh, what I want to say is that um, I, I love the idea that's, that range management could be based on science, but in actuality, it's based on a whole lot of other things. So rangeland management is known as uh, science and art. Uh, if you go to any textbooks on range, they'll talk about the science and art of range management. So science is the information, the art is the tradition and the hunches and the guesses and, and how you mix it all together. So in one way, it might seem kind of, um, I don't know, hoaxy or just sort of folk life type sort of situation. On the other hand, I think it's a real skill that people have to take all of these sources of information, turn them into useful decisions that will help us um, move towards a, a future that we desire. So why do we need science? I said range management is a science and an art. Why, why do we need science? Uh, the, range, the profession of range science is actually quite young. Uh, we started in the 40s and 50s when we started having the first scientific experiments on how range, uh, range systems worked. And so this profession is pretty young. Why do we need science to make decisions? One, I think, is that scientists, uh, I'm sorry, managers must integrate scientific, scientific knowledge with those traditions and hunches and guesses to make wise decisions. So it's two, two parts to that. You can't just base management just on science, but you need to integrate the science into other sources of information. It's also important to understand the physical, biological, and social processes that affect rangeland. That helps us make really sound decisions. And then we might discover principles that work here that might make uh, decisions expandable to other places in the world or might be able to tell us that that's not going to work somewhere else. So if you discover the principle of range management that's important and it has a scientific basis, then you'll be able to convert it to other places uh, where you could make wise use of rangelands or where you should know that it's not going to work. An idea might work here, but not there. So range science helps us discover those principles. There may be a ton of other ones in your in your mind. Um, I think most of the range managers that I've met um, that, are, that are really doing a good job and their land looks good, they are um, reading, they're learning, they're going to seminars and range science, understanding the scientific principles is very important. Okay, so we talked about range management and that you um, make decisions to get from where you are to the future, but what kinds of decisions are we talking about? What could you do to help you get from where you are to where you think the land should be. So you might think about this personally, but you might also just think about what could people in the area do? Well, first of all, when we talk about range management, we can make direct actions on the land. So this would be mostly landowners, land managers that would do something on the land. They might change a grazing prescription. They might do a prescribed fire. They might control some invasive plants. Those are direct actions on the land. And those certainly can be informed by both science and tradition. We can also ha make political decisions that will change the outcomes and opportunities we have on the land. So by um, weighing in on laws or policies, we can change um, what can be done on the land. So when you go and you vote for a person or you vote for a specific policy or law, that could change the way the, the land um, it operates. In other words, the kinds of things we can do on the land that will affect the land could be changed. Finally, 
Uh, you, we all buy and sell things every day. And when we buy products, we could enhance range management in one way or, or another. Uh, probably a good example of economic decisions would be a whole host of what they call branded beef these days. So you can buy beef now that, that the people that sold that to you will tell you that they are um, per, um, prescribing and they are adhering to specific uh, um, animal health and rangeland health uh, prescriptions. The, uh, an example would be the it used to be or, Oregon, uh, Oregon country beef, but now it's natural country beef. That's a branded beef where those people that sell under that label, uh, they, they commit to treating animals right and treating the land right. So that's an economic. If you bought that beef, that branded beef, that would be a way to support range management. Again, going back to this definition, the use and stewardship of rangelands to meet the needs of society. I mentioned earlier that what's changed is these desires, these goals and desires of humans. So on one hand, you might be interested in livestock production. Rangelands are being far, far more um, valued for uh, open space and for recreation and, and for science and for wildlife. So the desires of humans might change. Our ability to manage those resources for those desires is important. So what do people want from rangelands? These are the major resources that we would think of for rangelands. There's tons of them, but he here would be some of the major ones that we could manage for. Certainly livestock production. Historically, that's what rangelands were used for. It's still very, very important use of rangelands. More and more, we see increasing recreation on rangelands. Water is always important. Of course, rangelands are fairly arid ecosystems. We don't get a lot of precipitation per year, but maybe because of that, water is, is um, really important. And the water that is, hard, that is um, the snow and stuff that melts from the high elevations in the Western states flows through rangelands as it gets to lower elevation croplands. So water is really important. Growing uh, interest in energy, sustainable energy, rangelands, because we don't have a lot of trees and because we have a lot of wind, we're good locations for solar and for uh, wind power. Minerals historically have been important on rangelands, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Open space, again, a, a new resource for rangelands, uh, only because now as, as we become more and more urbanized, the value of open space becomes more and more important. Um, wildlife habitat has always been important, and I think it's at the core of much of what we do on rangelands. The forage is another important resource that we use on rangelands, both for livestock and wildlife. Native plants is something that um, many native tribes and uh, pioneers on the range uh, realize the values of native plants, especially for medicines and for human uh, uses. We're kind of rediscovering some of those ideas. The use of rangelands to meet the needs of, of humans, all of those um, resources we've just mentioned could be valid, valued by humans in one place or another. So what tools do we have to really develop those resources and make them available to humans? Here's the way I look at this. Um, I, I think that we as range managers are really, um, our, our goal is to really empower or to, um, to follow the tools that nature uses. Lands change by natural forces, and, and if we can understand and empower those, we could meet the, the, the needs of society. So on the left-hand side of this chart are those natural forces, and I'm going to add human impacts to that. So no matter what happens, rangelands are going to change, and they're going to change because of fire, because of grazing or herbivory, because of invasion of plants, uh, whether introduced or native, uh, invasive pl plants that invade and change the dominance of plants in an ecosystem. But human uses also change on the land. They, the developments and roads, uh, etc. cetera, um, they change the land, they fragment the land. Even recreation has uh, impacts on land. And then finally, we know that climate is changing. We don't always know exactly how that's going to, to all run, play out, but we're pretty sure that it's changing and it's changing the lands that we live on. So with those forces that are dynamic and they're changing the kinds of uh, value of rangelands, they can change the ecological services and resources that come from rangelands. Those ecological um, services and the resources we've just mentioned, forage for livestock, wildlife habitat, watershed values, biodiversity or conservation, open space, carbon sequestration, etc., etc. So that's what normally happens. 
Forces in nature and human activities change rangelands that affect the kinds of resources we can use on those lands. Where does management play in? I see management as a way of using those natural forces and, and really using them to direct rangelands to um, produce the ecological services and resources we want. In other words, fire is a natural process, but we can also use um, prescribed fire to change ecosystems, or we can change natural fire regimes to change ecosystems. Herbivory is a natural process. We use livestock grazing to, to apply herbivory and make ecosystem changes. Invasion is a natural process. We use weed management to alter that process. There's a lot of human uses and human impacts. We can change those by changing things like travel plans and jurisdictions of when development can happen or not. So we can alter human impacts and human uses of specific areas. And then finally, um, we could change, uh, we could do some actually quite agronomic practices on rangelands like planting seeds, uh, ch changing the, the um, community that, uh, of plants that are on an ecosystem, all of those things. Those tools change rangelands and they change the products that can be developed from them. So I guess in summary then, the tools of range management, if you go to school and you take a class in range management like this, or you become a range manager, the tools at your fingertips are gonna be fire, whether it be prescribed fire or changing the natural fire regime, livestock grazing, a way to harness herbivory, which is a powerful tool to change ecosystems, Integrated weed management, again, acknowledging that there's invasive plants and there's things that we can do with them. And we'll talk about that later in this course, but any range manager would have a, a, to, a set of tools related to integrated weed management in their toolbox. Finally, we, we have to acknowledge that humans have impacts on rangelands and there are ways that we can mediate, change or enhance those impacts, uh, such, such as recreation and development. And then uh, if we want to change the plant community, we could use restoration tools. Uh, we could actually plow or shred or reseed. There's things that we can do physically by changing uh, ecosystems through restoration or rehabilitation. So I'm gonna bring this all together by trying to highlight what are the basic concepts that a good rangeland manager should understand in order to do a good job of rangeland management. This is just a whole host of just kind of basic principles that I've um, thought about over the years and I've also gar uh, garnered from my colleagues. Here's some things you have to understand if you want to do a good job of manage la managing rangeland resources for people. First of all, rangelands are a renewable resource. They can produce on a sustained yield, meaning that they can produce uh, uh, valuable resources from year to year to year if they're properly managed. You need to manage to maintain soil and water uh, quality. That's the very basis of ecosystems. There's a lot of things you can use land for, they, and they're all good and they're all bad, but the one thing you have to do is maintain soil and water resources. Rangelands are managed by extensive and ecological principles. They're not intensive and agronomic. Other than some stuff that we do in restoration, most of what happens on rangelands is through our understanding of ecological principles. So a good range manager is a good ecologist. Another thing is we got to focus on landscapes, not one acre at a time. We really need to think about all the land that we manage in a landscape context. Another important principle is to remember that rangelands have a variety of values, forage, recreation, open space. And if you're a good manager, you're going to find a way to manage as many of those resources together. That's the principle of multiple use where you're really looking at the whole spread of, of resources that exist and you're really trying to manage those under multiple use principles. Another thought is that natural forces and values happen across multiple land ownerships. Fire doesn't care when it moves from private land to federal land. Watershed processes don't stop at the fence line. Weeds also are, are moving across landscapes and it doesn't, they don't care who owns those landscapes. Open space has value. Um, and sometimes to create vast landscapes, you have to work together with your other, with your neighbors or other people in the ecosystem. And, and who knows uh, whether they're federal or private or state or other um, landowners. So most of the important values of rangelands happen across vast um, ecosystems and multiple ownerships. Another one that you gotta get used to is you can't please all the people all the time. What one person wants may not meet the, meet the desires or plans of another person. So people have pretty strong uh, 
uh, views of what they want to see the land to look like. And um, as a manager, you better get kind of thick skin because if you make a decision, it might make a person mad at one time or, or, or um, happy at another. So you just got to do what you think is right for the land and, uh, and realize that someone's not going to like it. Another very important principle that goes back to the need to understand ecology is that rangelands change through ecological process called succession and through disturbance ecology. So succession is that, that natural movement of ecosystems uh, to a stable ecosystem based on the community or based on the climate and soils that exist there. And disturbances happen and those, um, those uh, communities respond to those disturbances. It's kind of complicated. Each place on earth has a little different set of successional processes and disturbances. And your ability as a manager is to understand those processes. So it takes a pretty deep knowledge of ecology and succession to be a good range manager. Also, the only constant thing on rangelands is change. Uh, conditions change from place to place, from time to time, from person to person. And so as a good rangeland manager is one that can really handle that dynamics. So it's really a multitasking person who can handle dynamics. It's a pretty exciting opportunity to try to manage a system that is always changing. And finally, the last one, if you do nothing, the land is not going to return to some natural paradise. The land is always changing. It's going to change with or without humans. So uh, don't get into the trap of the, the illusion that if we just step back and do nothing, the land is going to go bounce back to some natural system. Um, it's far better to have some idea of, of what you want the land to look like and make some actions to try to get the land to that condition. As we leave now, um, don't forget some of the many challenges we have on rangeland. There are many forces that threaten the integrity or the health of rangelands. Things that we need to keep our eyes on as rangeland managers, managers are unsustainable grazing practices, damaging fire regimes, invasive plants that um, come into our ecosystems, global climate change, human development, diseases and insects that can damage plants and animals in the ecosystem. And all of that's kind of a downer, but maybe look at the bright side of it. These are challenges that we can manage and that we need some more bright people in this field. We need some more ingenuity and some working together to address these challenges that, that um, affect rangelands. So with that, I hope I gave you just a little bit of an overview of what rangeland management is, this planning process that we try to use as we become good rangeland managers. And then finally, what are the, the kind of guiding principles and the challenges that we have on rangelands? Thanks.